I'd like to start uh, our launch program. Um, my name is uh, Kiyuk Shin. I'm director of Shirin Shirin APAC and also Korea program uh, here at Stanford. And I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, special uh, event. Uh, actually, this is uh, part of uh, annual uh, Korea conference. Uh, as I mentioned in the morning, uh, we have uh, very general support uh, from Coret Foundation in San Francisco that sponsors uh, one fellowship and also uh, annual uh, conference. Uh, this year, uh, we've been discussing on uh, those great issues, and it's really my great honor and pleasure to <coughs> introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, General uh, Vince uh, Brooks or Park uh, Yu-jong Sang-gun-nim in Korea. Actually, he has a uh, Korean name. And I met him uh, several times, uh, both here at Stanford, also uh, in Korea, uh, uh, when he was uh, commander of uh, US forces uh, in Korea. Actually, he had uh, three heads, uh, commander of US forces, and also commander of uh, US ROK combined, I guess, forces, and then also UN in a command. Uh, you know, his name uh, in Korean, Park uh, Yu Jong, uh, I'll explain briefly what that means. Uh, I, I think you represent a person of leadership and confidence, and Jong uh, refers to his uh, wisdom and uh, capability. So I think his name really captures uh, who uh, he is. And you know, we have many uh, friends from Korea uh, in this room, and uh, uh, General Brooks uh, is considered the most uh, respected and, and popular uh, you know, U.S. generals uh, in Korean history right here. <laughs> so I'm really happy to uh, have him uh, here today. And uh, today's format is uh, he will be speaking for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a conversation with my colleague but also former general, uh, Carl Aikenberry, and I'm sure he will share more secrets uh, with uh, <laughs> General Brooks. But you know, Carl uh, has been with us for many years now, uh, leading uh, our uh, US uh, East Asia Security Initiative. And you know, Carl himself uh, was a military general uh, serving in Afghanistan <coughs> as both a commander and also uh, later ambassador. So, so I uh, invite uh, Jerry Brooks uh, to speak for about 20 minutes and then invite uh, Carl uh, to have a conversation. Then we'll open up uh, for uh, uh, you know, Q&A. But uh, first, uh, please uh, welcome uh, General Brooks. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, first, thank you all for, for coming. And uh, we've got a pretty full room here, that's great. Uh, because this is certainly a topic that is of uh, great interest to a number of people, and uh, I hope that I can add some insights that will be beneficial to you today. I, I first want to thank Gyu Shin uh, for the privilege of being able to come and, and to speak today uh, during this excellent conference that is ongoing. We had an excellent morning, and uh, this midday mid session I think will add to it, and then there'll be more that happens this afternoon as well. Um, I want to thank Carl Eikenberry also, a, a great patriot and leader, uh, who has served uh, our nation with distinction in many different positions of great responsibility, uh, retiring as a three-star general, but also serving as an ambassador, a classic illustration of the warrior statesman. And uh, it's, it's an honor to be able to share the stage with you this afternoon. Uh, I have to thank Heather Ahn also. Heather Ahn is a, a work in the background kind of person, but she's the one who got me out here. So Heather, thank you very much for your assistance <laughs> and hard work. Well, I'm actually retired now. I uh, retired on the 1st of January this year, 2019, so I'm just a few months into retirement and trying to figure out what that actually means. <laughs> and this is an academic institution, so I think I'm probably getting a, a C- minus or a D in retirement at this point by remaining perhaps a bit more active than, uh, than I thought I would when I looked at retirement and contemplated it. Uh, but that came at the end of uh, really 42 years of service having walked into the U.S. Military Academy in 1976. And it culminated with that tremendous opportunity and assignment in Korea, as Gyu Shin described, in those three positions, those three hats, three very important commands 
over all of the U.S. forces in Korea, over the combined forces of the Republic of Korea and the United States. And that's somewhere on the order of 625 to 628,000 troops in a time of war. And then finally, uh, the commander of uh, the very old now United Nations Command established in 1950. And it was a tremendous privilege, I, I have to tell you that. So let me uh, do a few things here in the, the short amount of time we have for opening remarks. Uh, we want to really get to the conversation between myself and uh, General Eikenberry, as well as uh, interacting with all of you who may have questions uh, that you want to share with me. I, I want to say that I, I've spent about five and a half years of duty in Korea during my career. It's two different assignments, and both of them were in command positions, positions of responsibility. Uh, and I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about Korea. I learned a lot about the envir environment, the culture, uh, what it is that motivates people in different ways, and certainly uh, the fact that it was a second time gave me some advantages and so Gi Wook Shin was very kind to describe me as, uh, as being admired and respected in South Korea. Uh, but trust me, the feeling is mutual. So I, I certainly have a great love for the Republic of Korea and my service there. I was, uh, for a period of time, operating without an ambassador. And I think that will become important as we talk about what cir circumstances and considerations we had to go through in the years 2016 to 2018 about 30 months of time there, 15 of those months were without a senior civilian in the position of ambassador in the Republic of Korea. And that uh, then demanded an approach from me as a military commander, which may be seen as not traditional, but was necessary at the time. That was to stretch beyond military considerations into the other considerations that represented both nations as well as the countries that were part of the United Nations Command. And when I say both nations, I mean the Republic of Korea and the, the United States of America, since I was a, a commander working for both presidents <laughs> in that point in time. Uh, what I learned from my time there, frankly, is that there are always opportunities, and there are also always challenges. And we can't be hindered just by the challenges and thus avoid the opportunities. Nothing will change things might get worse. There has to be a, a willingness and a courage to try uh, to pursue the opportunities, and, and that's really what we did. And I'll tell you that uh, as, a, uh, as a retiree, I recently moved into a new house, and it's got a large yard, and I find myself having to do a lot of trimming the bushes and bringing the hedges down and clearing brush and that sort of thing. And it occurred to me as I was flying out here yesterday, that's kind of like the situation in Korea. There's a lot of brush and undergrowth that has happened over these many, many years of the Republic of Korea-United States relationship and certainly in the longer issues of North Korea, South Korea relations, Korea, Japan, Russia, China relations, regional relations. And every now and then you have to trim back the brush in order to see what is good and to keep it alive and flourishing. And so much of the work that uh, is ongoing right now, I would say, is in that category of clearing out the brush. So I want you to have that as a frame of reference as I, as I talk to you about some of my observations and, uh, and, and quickly uh, expose those to you. So right up front, let me talk about the summit, the most recent second U.S.-North Korea summit that occurred in Hanoi. And I'll just give you a couple of quick shots on how I view that. And this is my own opinion. You should understand that as we go in. First thing, here's what the summit showed. Kim Jong-un, the leader in North Korea, the chairman, is not agile when he's under pressure. He was perhaps surprised at the way things turned during the summit, and he was unable to maneuver. That's important. It's both a disadvantage for him, perhaps, but it's an, it's an opportunity for those who work with him, to find ways to help him continue to move because he has to maneuver in order for there to be change. So that's the first thing. He was not agile. The second thing, <coughs> th second thing is that Kim Jong-un values economic de development more than he values nuclear weapons. And I realize that uh, not everyone will agree with me on that. 
Some will say that the nuclear weapons are the basis for his future existence. I don't believe that's the case. I think he values economic development and being the one to deliver North Korea's economic development more than he does nuclear weapons. And he will trade off nuclear weapons for economic development. Of course, he would desire to have both. That's very clear from his, his plan of 2016 where he was going to pursue both the weapons development program and economic development as a dual track to bring North Korea forward. But by engaging in the weapons uh, developments, he essentially foreclosed the economic development. And now he's down to the choice of which one do I keep? And so given the right amount of pressure and the right basis for decision, Kim Jong-un, in my view, will give up the nuclear weapons. He has said he would do that, and we'll have to see whether he will or will not. Lots of reason to not believe what I just said. So trust me, I'm with you on that. <laughs> but we have to look for what is possible and pursue the opportunities, not be thwarted by the challenges when they show up. So I'll just share that with you as a thought. Uh, I would say to you that Kim Jong-un, and perhaps more broadly North Korea, does not want to rely on China for anything. Don't view them as friends. China already has control over more than 90% of the North Korean economy. That is not an impressive economy. If China really wanted to help, they could have done so a long time ago, and they've done very little for North Korea through the years. I think that's a reality we have to take stock of. That may account for why there was such a long train trip and not a borrowed airplane for the second summit, because there were borrowed aircraft the first time. The Chinese were very kind to borrow that. What kind of branding is that then for the North Korean leader to land somewhere in Asia, in Singapore in that case, and step off of a Chinese aircraft? Rather to take a long train trip than to signal any kind of reliance on China. I think that's an important takeaway that has to not be walked past. It has to be considered in everything else that's done because much of what's going on has to do with China, not just with the United States and North Korea relationship. I would say also, as we're just taking some snapshots from the summit, it's my belief that Kim Jong-un underestimated President Trump and overestimated what he perceived as President Trump being in a desperate situation. He guessed wrong on that. Uh, sometimes uh, in other countries, U.S. dynamics, U.S. activities are very visible. I saw, I saw that in nearly every country that I served in around the world. They watch very closely what's happening in the United States. But often countries will project that into their own understanding of how their own politics will work. And therefore, they may believe that there was desperation on the part of the United States president. They guessed wrong. There wasn't. There wasn't. And as a result, the president of the United States could walk away from a deal and not be desperate about having it brought to closure at that point in time. The next observation I would share with you is that the Republic of Korea has demonstrated that it knows how to lower the tension with North Korea. And I can tell you that when I came into command in 2016, it didn't look like that. It looked more like tension was rising and we were concerned at that point in time that South Korea would take some sort of preemptive action against North Korea, having been attacked by North Korea several times uh, most recently, the Chonan incident in 2010 and the shelling of Yongpyong Island uh, as well, both of which resulted in losses of life. And so that has changed. South Korea, under President Moon Jae-in, has found ways to lower tension and create opportunities for dialogue and move things in a different direction toward diplomacy and away from military activity. Are very important to understand. I believe that because of that, because South Korea has demonstrated their ability to do that, the U.S. should listen more to the perspective of South Korea. Does it mean that the U.S. and South Korea have to fundamentally agree on everything? I would say that having been a commander in an alliance, managing the alliance is very important to both countries, preserving it, keeping it strong. But there are two different perspectives in that alliance, like in a good marriage. It's two different perspectives, two different views of how to address a particular problem and achieve a commonly accepted end. 
there's two different sets of ways. And the ways have to be acknowledged that sometimes one of the other partners is right. So I, I would submit that the U.S. has to make sure that it's open to the methods that South Korea has learned. And then we, that there's capitalizing on the capabilities of both countries. The U.S. with its global leadership, especially its ability to impact things uh, in the global economic sphere, and South Korea's ability to understand the culture and know how to move things forward. That's a powerful combination that stands up against North Korea. Very challenging for North Korea to work through when those two are well coordinated. The last thing is that uh, Kim Jong-un lost face during this most recent summit. He didn't come back with what he wanted. And indeed, with these miscalculations, might even be embarrassed. And in Asia, before there's going to be another step, there's going to be a face-saving move by Kim Jong-un. Now, what that move is, we don't know, whether it's uh, this demonstrating that we can resume missile launches at any point in time, as we uh, heard from Che Son Hee just in the last few days, uh, his vice foreign minister, or it, whether it's something else, whether it's something stronger internally to North Korea, that's not clear, but he'll do something to try to equalize what he believes now is a positional disadvantage. And we should be looking for that and not be surprised or disappointed when it comes, but rather to put it in context, which is it's his cultural imperative to do that before he can move forward or come back to a negotiating table. Okay, just a couple of thoughts in on, on what 2016 to 18 looked like uh, from my eyes in those seats that I was uh, fulfilling. I, I used to hear about Korea being the land of the morning calm. And it does have beautiful mornings, you know, with fog in the valleys and the, the countless hills. There's always another hill in Korea. But the experience told us it was really the land of the morning surprise. <laughs> because nearly every day there is something. And, and quite candidly, uh, this is not just attributed to North Korea. This is a bit of a three-way dance where the United States and North Korea are touching one another, North Korea and South Korea are touching one another, and South Korea and the United States are touching one another. And all three are maneuvering and dancing together at the same time with tension being put on each one of those three relationships and with some outside players around those three, Russia, China, Japan especially, making it even more difficult to do the dance among the three. So every day it seemed that there was a new surprise coming from one of those players, a Washington surprise, a Seoul surprise, a Pyongyang surprise. And when you thought you had one part of it settled, something else would come loose. When I first came into command, of course, we had in the United States, President Obama, and in the Republic of Korea, the uh, President Park Geun-hye. And at the time, it seemed, as I mentioned, that North, South Korea was much more likely to engage in a preemptive action. And much of our energy was spent to make sure that that didn't happen within the alliance, that there was always going to be an alliance decision and that there wouldn't be unilateral action that would create a sudden escalation, as we saw in 2015. That changed. That changed in the early spring of 2017 after elections in the United States, but after an impeachment in South Korea. And having been present for all of that uh, was quite an interesting journey. But as that change occurred, it was a different consideration. It was far more likely, at least in the minds of the South Koreans, that the U.S. might engage in a preemptive action, that South Korea didn't want to get drawn into uh, a protracted conflict that would create great destruction in South Korea. And suddenly, how we ab addressed that dance was different. All the while, of course, North Korea was increasing its pace of testing. And whether you can characterize them as a provocation or not, and some would call them that, that they're deliberately done to provoke South Korea, Russia, China, Japan, and the United States, all five countries around North Korea, Others would say they were simply testing, uh, but testing done in such a way that it created great concern internationally. In many ways, Kim Jong-un was trying to raise the visibility of the North Korean problem to the international stage and keep it there, which is something that his father and grandfather were not successful in doing. Even the Korean War 
was viewed as a conflict, not, a, not an outright war as it should have been. So it never reached that international crescendo that Kim Jong-un was able to achieve as he pursued and tested nuclear weapons twice during my time there. Two nuclear tests, the fifth and the sixth nuclear tests. Uh, let me just say that uh, the, among the opportunities, there are many, but to pursue the opportunities that exist on finding a way through this nuclear problem, finding a way toward peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, the challenges are many. I think chief among them is the potential of missing signals. Because the cultures are so different, the Korean culture, the American culture, the Chinese, Japanese, and Russian cultures, they're so different, each one of them, that the signals that are being sent by any one of the players, especially those three who are involved in the close dance, are often missed. I'll give you an illustration to that that I, that I saw happen in my own experience. <clears throat> in 2017, as we saw this quickening pace and the change of leadership in the Republic of Korea and the United States, it appeared that we were on a, a trajectory toward military conflict. All the while, our objective was actually to create a sufficient degree of pressure to make Kim Jong-un change his mind about how to pursue his ultimate aims and for him to choose diplomatic methods, not the military methods that were evident to him and being made into greater preparation. There came a time in the middle of 2017 where pressure was rising significantly. By about April 2017, we anticipated there were preparations for another nuclear test, a sixth nuclear test, in spite of the sanctions that had come in after the fifth and the fourth. That didn't happen, though, because the military pressure and the international cooperation also were rising. Military pressure increased significantly. We began to demonstrate capability in ways that North Korea had not seen before, showing him that, uh, that he can't have the same degree of comfort that he once had, that we would only go to a certain point and never go beyond. And that pattern had been well established by then. Instead, uh, Kim Jong-un went quiet relatively quiet for a period of time. And our own U.S. negotiators at the time were trying to just cool things down, as were the South Korean uh, leaders, try to cool things down for a period of time. Let's see if we can just get things quiet with no testing, no provocation for about 60 days. The U.S. perspective was that you have to tell us when you start those 60 days. Otherwise, it doesn't count. The North Korean approach was, I, I don't have that obligation to tell you anything, you should be able to see for yourself. And we went 78 days, and it didn't count. The signals were missed. North Korea was sending the signal that, okay, things are quieter now, we haven't done anything for 78 days. The U.S. said, didn't count. Pressure was still high and went up further. The sixth nuclear test didn't happen. Right around the same time as the U.N. General Assembly and the rhetoric became much harsher during that 2017 UN General Assembly. Thereafter, though, we went another number of days until the 29th of November, 2017, which was the final intercontinental ballistic missile test launch. The longest in its, du in its duration, it's the, it was able to range more of the United States than any of the other ones uh, before that, as well as all of the alliance partners of the United States. And some view that that was just one more step and a good reason to take it beyond that to military action. Others believe that Kim Jong-un was equalizing and, and, and resetting face and that a change would come very quickly. In a matter of hours, actually, after the launch that morning, a statement was put out saying he's gone as far as he needs to go. For many, that was not believable because of their pattern of behavior. But it is now 471 days since he said he was going in a different direction. Does it count? Do we acknowledge that there's a change or is our disbelief going to drive us into, it's just a matter of time before he begins to start again? It's 471 days. 
where it has been true. So the potential of missing one another's signals is significant and is to me perhaps the greatest hazard in this entire process. Let me just close by, by saying that uh, all of us, I think, are, are trying to come to grips with what is the way ahead. How do you, how do you move forward from here after the most recent summit? By the way, the, the summit scores are now four to three to two to zero, zero. That would be four that China has had with Kim Jong-un, that Xi Jinping has had with Kim Jong-un, three that Moon Jae-in, president of South Korea, has had with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, two that President Trump has had with Kim Jong-un, zero that Russia has had, zero that Japan has had, both of whom have stated a desire to meet with North Korea, but the timing is not right yet for that. So this season of summitry has, uh, has blossomed in many ways, but what is the way forward from here? For the U.S., I would submit that the U.S. should recognize that it actually does have a strong position right now and that for change to occur, the U.S., as the stronger power, will need to stand in the open door. You can't stand behind it. You can't just say it's unlocked because that signal will be missed. Somehow standing in the open door and making it very clear that dialogue can continue will be required. The second is that there has to be continued engagement. The potential of misunderstanding one another is so great and guaranteed, really. The only way to work through misunderstanding on things like that is through dialogue, direct dialogue. And that we have channels of dialogue puts us in a far better condition in 2019, even with a summit that didn't end well, a far better condition than we were in 2017 when there was no dialogue and an escalating condition. So that has to be capitalized on as a tremendous opportunity to resolve and clarify and, don't be, and to not be disappointed when we find that we didn't get the outcomes we wanted. The third thing that I would submit to you is for the way ahead is we need to increase sanctions. The cost of achieving economic development has to go up as a result of Hanoi. Does it need to be as full a set as the previous 11? Not necessarily. But by gambling on getting all or six of the 11 relieved in exchange for Young Beyond Nuclear Research and Development Facility uh, being externally inspected, in exchange for that, that was not a good deal in the, the mind of the President of the United States. Cost has to go up. So more sanctions are probably needed. And, and North Korea will understand that, believe it or not. They may say, how can you impose sanctions and be expressing a desire to have a friendly new relationship? They understand the duality of that. There needs to be a, an economic development plan that is created now. South Korea has some desire for that. It needs to be much broader, though, than the local north-south exchanges that are being contemplated. It has to be an international economic development plan for North Korea. And that planning by itself exposes to North Korea that there is a serious potential for them if they maneuver correctly toward denuclearization. And if they don't, that will be unfulfilled potential, and they can see it materialize. So economic development planning beginning now to be implemented later when conditions have been set, and those dis conditions have to be discussed and concluded, is part of what needs to occur. And then finally, uh, there needs to be a reassurance for the Republic of Korea and Japan especially, who are most affected by this. South Korea is the most affected truly, and Japan would be second most affected by the circumstances. There has to be reassurance that this is moving, it is different than before, and it can end up in the right direction. And we should seek the counsel, especially of South Korea, on how to do that. So I, I remain somewhat optimistic about uh, the opportunities. That's just the way I'm wired. I, I tend to be more opportunistic than pessimistic. And that uh, there, there can be a way toward peace and stability in Korea and in the broader region. But it's going to require greater creativity, greater empathy, and a greater collective engagement in order to get to that. So with that, I, I thank you for your time. Hope that gets you started and maybe we'll prompt some questions and I look forward to the uh, conversation with Carl Eikenberry here. So thank you again very much.
So uh, Hugh, I gave a great uh, introduction. Just a, a couple of uh, points I'd like to add. Uh, first of all, Vince is a, a graduate of the United States Military Academy. In his freshman year at West Point, uh, he played basketball, and the coach was Coach Mike Krzyzewski before he went to Duke. Wow. Last night, uh, over a second beer, Vince confided, confided in me and said that everything Coach K learned about basketball, he learned from that freshman cadet. <laughs> Not hardly. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second, the second, a West Point uh, uh, story as well. I give you the lead because it's a question for the audience. So, uh, General Brooks, when he was the UN commander in Korea, you know, I talked about these different hats: U.S. combined, U.S. ROC, UN, a third hat. He shared uh, that with General MacArthur. General MacArthur was the first UN commander. Now, the question for this audience. What did General MacArthur and General Brooks share in common in their West Point experience? What's that? They were both the first captains. They were both the uh, brigade uh, commanders at uh, West Point. Third is a serious note here about General Brooks. Uh, we all recognize General Brooks on the world stage here, Korea, and a brilliant command there during uh, times of uh, great trouble. Uh, but before that, uh, if you are in the United States Army, you'll recognize this list I give you. General Brooks served in the 82nd Airborne Division, the 1st Infantry Division, the 2nd Infantry Division, the 3rd Infantry Division, the 1st Cavalry Division, 3rd Corps, 3rd U.S. Army, and he commanded U.S. Army Pacific. Those are all very storied commands. In addition to that, he served in peacekeeping operations in Kosovo, and four times as a general officer in combat in Iraq, the Middle East, and Central Asia. So he did a little bit before he got to Korea. Uh, Vince, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I think we got about 20 minutes, and uh, I'm going to just ask two questions, because this audience has got a lot uh, that they want to uh, exchange views with you on. The first is that GWAC had uh, correctly laid out this all these complex relationships and commands mm -hmm. in Korea. So in normal times, in uh, times of uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula, your command position is extraordinarily fraught with complexities. You've got one line that comes from the Blue House. You've got one line that's coming from the White House. You've got authorities that are coming through the ROC government, and you're working directly with their Minister of Defense. You're working directly with our Secretary of Defense. And then to add to that complexity, even within these military commands, you've got a command in Hawaii, of which you're a subordinate command to as well. Uh, add to this the United Nations command hat. So normally hard, but during the time of maximum military pressure, I would imagine this was uh, mission impossible. Maybe the easier problem was North Korea and trying to work all these relationships. Can you talk a little bit about how you worked your way through that? What was your first principles? What's your advice to uh, successors that uh, come in and take your place? Yeah, thanks, Carl. It, it was challenging. Uh, I'll be honest about that. The, the first challenge, though, was to make sure that uh, I and that my staff and my subordinate commanders understood the difference from one command to the next, and it use that difference, or use those differences to our advantage. And so, for example, the United Nations Command is a multilateral command. It had several countries involved in that from the Korean War, and that was a very strong platform for international dialogue with all the embassies of those countries who still have presence in South Korea. Uh, it became critical to us as we were thinking about the challenges leading up to the Olympics and everything else. And so that also happens to be the command that is the enforcer of the Armistice Agreement. It's the signatory to the Armistice Agreement in 1953 and therefore would play an, a key role throughout 2018 in enabling the dialogue once again with North Korea. So it was actually UN command that was doing the talking to North Korea when we finally had the door open after the Singapore summit and even resulted in uh, one of our U.S. aircraft, a U.S. jet transport aircraft, flying into North Korea, 
landing at North Korea's request at Wonsan Airfield, their, one of their major bases on the East Coast, retrieving 55 sets of remains and delivering them back to South Korea for processing and then on to Hawaii for identification. And so it was UN command that made it possible to do that. We had to recognize that that was a different authority than U.S. Forces Authority, for example, which did not have that type of a mandate or, or a responsibility. You mentioned the Hawaii headquarters, very important to us. Uh, since the assets that would be used in defending the Republic of Korea are largely not in Korea. They are beyond Korea as far reaching as anywhere in the globe. They can be assembled under the command of that commander in Hawaii. And at the latter portion of my command, there was Admiral Phil Davidson. And prior to that, Admiral Harry Harris, who is now the ambassador in Seoul for the United States. They had the, they had the toolbox uh, that would make all the difference. So uh, keeping them well informed on what we needed from a U.S. perspective and the U.S. contribution to the Alliance Command in these challenging times as well as in a potential wartime was a very important understanding. And then thirdly, that, that last role of the Combined Forces Command with two national chains, the United States and South Korea, but being located in South Korea and making certain that the South Korean leadership understood what I was thinking as a, as a commander and that I was very clear along with my staff that I was an alliance commander in that role, not a U.S. commander and not a South Korean commander, and that my decisions and recommendations to them would be the best military advice I could give in the interests of the alliance. So each one of those was different. Mm -hmm. One was for the international community. One was for and talking to North Korea. One was for the U.S. only unilateral aspects, and the third was for those bilateral aspects that would be so critical at a time of crisis or war. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, my advice, I guess, on that to answer the last part of the question is know the difference. If you're multi-headed, know the difference in each command and use those differences to your advantage. Great. Thanks. I'll ask uh, one more brief question, then let's open it up right away. Um, you talked about having to be both a war fighting commander and to think hard about diplomacy. You did go through a period of time without an ambassador, a long period of time. Uh, as you look at this balance between diplomacy and war fighting, let's take one particular example here where decision was made to suspend or to put in abeyance exercising with the ROC Army and the, uh, the U.S. military. Many people say that that exercising that takes place is really important. That alliance warfare is hard war, is difficult, and that you need the exercises in order to keep the readiness, and that readiness then is part of deterrence. What's your view about exercising? Uh, I know it was a political decision that was made. Uh, does that come at any risk? Well, it, it is fundamentally a political decision, and it's an important one, especially in the context of trying to uh, drive North Korea into a certain direction where they chose diplomatic actions over uh, potential military actions and that the interlocutor that they want to meet is the Secretary of State, not the Secretary of Defense. And that's really how we looked at it. It was quite that simple. Uh, so the exercises are very important to the not only the readiness of the forces who are present in Korea and those who might also come to Korea from the global posturing that I described, there are equally important in creating the dynamic of the organization itself. And so it really was the Combined Forces Command that is the focus of these exercises. But the U.S. Forces and the United Nations Command also exercise as part of it so that the relationships in a time of war could be uh, ironed out in advance. You don't want to meet each other as strangers on any battlefield. Uh, that's that's an that's old military axiom. Uh, and you do that by having exercises, practice, and relationships in advance of the true test. And so the absence of them drove me as a commander and my subordinate commanders into having to be more creative. How do you maintain readiness to go to war and fight tonight, which was a mantra on the Korean Peninsula, when you have fewer opportunities to train in a collective sense? Well, there's no question that, uh, that there's some diminution of readiness that comes from that. I would, I'd, I'd be uh, untruthful if I said that it didn't reduce some of our capability not the least of which is kind of the tidal cycle of personnel changes in the combined command. The Americans tend to come in in the summertime of a given year. 
the South Koreans tend to change position in the middle of a given year, in the winter of a given year. And so the exercises are positioned in such a way that the expertise of the old timers helps to bring in the new players every six months or so. So there's a tidal cycle that uh, went with those exercises. So we had to find other ways to do that. And that means it's smaller exercises, less visible exercises, uh, exercises with a different scope or scale. Uh, these types of things are, are what was necessary. Our military advice was don't touch the on-off switch. Don't make it an on-off proposition about do the exercises, do not do the exercises, but rather to use like a graphic equalizer to adjust these other measures. You can use an exercise for deterrence by making it very visible to your adversary what your capabilities are. You can use an exercise for reassurance. Both of these can have diplomatic value using a military instrument. And so what we try to do is be thoughtful about that and even made recommendations on the adjustment of timing with regard to our spring exercise, which was going to uh, be concurrent with the end of the Pyeongchang Olympics. And because the tension was associated with uh, the military ac activities in late 2017, many of the countries who were contemplating participation weren't sure whether they should send athletes or not. And they would ask me as a military commander, but also the senior US official in the country at the time, should we risk bringing our athletes? Will they be secure or is something going to happen while we're here? And so making a military recommendation to move the timing, to displace that from the Olympics so the Olympics could happen free and clear, uh, came from a military recommendation, ultimately a political decision. So th this is how uh, this all goes together. I, I think the point of it all is senior military commanders especially have to be mindful of how their instrument is used in a way that achieves other purposes. Economic pressure on North Korea, for example. By us exercising, North Korea tends to exercise. We extend the length of an exercise, they will extend the length of an exercise. If that's putting more pressure on the fuel they consume, then I can impact their economic activity mm -hmm. by my military activity. Diplomatic influences. There are all these things that are, that are necessary. And of course, political and social ones as well uh, come into play. So we have to be much more mindful at the very senior level that nothing is done in isolation. A military activity is not an isolated event. It is part and parcel of the totality of a US expression as well as this uh, multinational and binational expression that came out in the three commands and has to serve other purposes than the military purposes themselves. Great, thanks Vince. Let's go ahead and open it up. And <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, when we call on somebody, if you would uh, give your name and uh, what uh, organization you're with and let me first give to, are there any students, Stanford students here that have a question to give them the uh, first uh, cut? <laughs> you may be cutting class wait, to be here. So wait, uh, <laughs> wait for the microphone, please. We have one here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jin Yu. I'm an undergrad here at Stanford. Um, my question was regarding actually the exercises that has been um, concluded recently. I believe that the full eagle was an uh, exercise that real that was a large exercise that deals with the like, U.S. armed force, the projection of U.S. armed forces into Korea. But I was like, is it something? So does that mean that there's a lower um, determinants on the U.S. side to project forces, like in terms of um, in situations, in dire situations per se, or is it at least? what we're trying to tell North Korea. Like, because I believe that those type of exercises are one of, a ty one of a kind exercises that can't really be replaced by other exercises per se, or at least the general public in Korea, I believe, thinks so. So I thought, I was wondering what your opinion on that Yeah, was. thanks for the question. So the key resolve was part of a pair of exercises that would happen in the springtime, late winter, springtime. Full Eagle and Key Resolve. Key resolve is the command post exercise. That's the, the senior levels of command doing a computer driven exercise with a world class opposing force to give us the, the uh, greatest possible stimulation and uh, to build the readiness in the senior levels. Full Eagle was a field maneuver that actually had forces in the field maneuvering side by side. Koreans and Americans and sometimes uh, from other countries, UN sending states as well uh, might participate from time to time. 
Uh, so the full eagle exercise is the one that was reduced this time, and Key Resolve has now been set aside and replaced by a new exercise series uh, called Dong Meng, which it means alliance. Uh, so Dong Meng 19-1 is what just occurred. Uh, it will <coughs> yield many of the same types of benefits as the uh, Key Resolve exercise, focused mostly on the command post. And then there will also still be smaller exercises for field maneuvers throughout the year. Those didn't go away. But you'll hear less about them. So remember, if one of the graphic equalizer controls is volume. Turn the volume down on the exercises until such time as you need to use it as a deliberate signal, whether it's a deterrence signal, a, retur a, 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 a reassurance signal, uh, a indication of a resumption of activity or a reduction of activity. Move the volume that way. So there will be smaller, more frequent exercises done in a uh, physical sense uh, out in the field by all the forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines of both countries as well as the UN sending states. But you won't hear as much about it. Uh, back there, to, uh, right. Um, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm Kirk Yunjian, <coughs> postdoc here um, at APOC. So my question is, you sort of say that China is an outside player, which China does not necessarily agree. So I was kind of wondering, uh, from your perspective, what roles, or limitations, or obstacles uh, does China pose to the situation on the Korean Peninsula? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that China will always act in its own interest and uh, tends to overplay its hand on some things when acting in its own interest, as, uh, as I believe they did in response to the THAAD deployment. Uh, they were very harsh to South Korea economically and uh, to a lesser degree diplomatically. They still had diplomatic relations, but those grew a bit cold. And in doing so, China signaled who they are, who they were, who they will be. And it was a reminder to everyone in the region. This is well beyond the Korean Peninsula. But everyone in the region, Vietnam, Laos, others, uh, to just see China as it is. Now, I think China's interest is to have a degree of status quo. China prefers status quo over things. It, they don't like change. And if it's a status quo that isn't hazardous to their interest, then they'll preserve that as long as possible. So the 90% control of the North Korean economy, that's a good status quo to have because with that they believe they have leverage. North Korea, I believe, would like to shake that off but can't. With that degree of control, they can't just walk away from, from China without great risk. Uh, so China will have a role then in not only enforcing sanctions, but China is also maneuvering for economic development independently of all others, setting conditions for economic development in certain areas to ensure that they still have a very tight grip on what North Korea is and does. Uh, but I think that uh, North Korea probably recognizes, and maybe we should all recognize, that uh, this may be a bit harsh, but North Korea will always be a buffer state to China and protecting it from a strong South Korea or U.S. alliance that is on the peninsula with a foothold and maybe even, as they view it, as has been shared to me by Chinese leaders, a militarized Japan or remilitarized Japan or an arms race in the region that they believe the United States is triggering. And these things have all been told to me by senior Chinese military officials. So they clearly play a role, but I, I, I would submit to you that there's probably a much deeper issue in play here, and it's why China maneuvered so quickly as the season of summitry opened and why the score is 4 to 3 to 2 to 0 to 0. China wants to stay in what appears to be an advantageous position <coughs> as a most favored partner for North Korea, even if they're not. The outcomes of these meetings tend to be communicated by China, as to what the meeting's composition was and how it turned out. And North Korea, really, North Korea really doesn't have an option to take a contrary view to that for now. So having said that, uh, China will be a, an inhibitor to North Korean development in the long term and would desire not to have a strong, consolidated, reunified North and South Korea that's in the corner or closely aligned with the United States and or Japan. They would not want to see that happen. And they will take actions to 
slow the potential of that and maybe even outright halt it if they see it emerging. So that's what you should expect to see from China over the next several years. I think we have time for one more question, then I'd like to ask to finish up with a, uh, a final question for uh, you and David. I'd like to ask three very brief but related questions about the issue of U.S. military action against uh, North Korea. If I understood what you said correctly, it was something along the lines that in 2017, it seemed that the U.S. Was, might be on the road to military conflict with North Korea, but all along the goal was to put pressure on North Korea, I, I gather, to do the right thing. Um, can I take that to mean that you do not believe that Trump was serious about uh, going to war with North Korea or preparing to go to North war with North Korea? Second, President Trump has repeatedly stated that uh, if Obama had remained president or someone else had been president, we would have gone to war on the Korean Peninsula already. Do you believe that? And finally, you indicated that this fire and fury rhetoric frightened our South Korean allies. On balance, do you believe that using that kind of rhetoric was in <coughs> our interest or those of our allies? And remember, you're not wearing your uniform anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer this carefully. Uh, first, it was serious. I want to be very clear about that. So President Trump was serious. And uh, it, it, our ability and our readiness to go to war were real and true. Okay? Uh, we had some capabilities built up there that we hadn't seen in years. And we're in the best posture to conduct operations uh, in, in my 20 plus years of experience with Korea. So it was serious. Um, would we have gone to war if a different president were in place? Uh, you want to talk about a hypothetical. We didn't. <coughs> and so uh, I, I would simply leave it at that. That didn't happen. We averted war in this term, in this presidency. And whether we would or would not have before, I, I, I don't really want to characterize. I, I will tell you, we didn't go to war in the previous administration. And we certainly had potential to do that then, just as we do now. So it's a matter of a political decision that's coupled with the <coughs> international will that goes with that. Now, as to the fire and fury third part of the question, uh, it, it, it is frightening language because it is certainly non-traditional in international relations to engage in such rhetoric. And similarly, the counter rhetoric that was coming from North Korea was at the very least provocative and worthy of a punch in the nose, uh, at the very least. Uh, clearly, there was discussion then about bloody nose theories and this sort of thing. There, there was no such military planning. That's not how we plan military operations. You need to be ready to go all in. If you put your toe in, you better be ready to be submerged with your whole body because you never know where military action is going to go once it's initiated. And so uh, was the rhetoric helpful or not? I, I happen to believe that it is one part of a combination of conditions that created pressure that caused Kim Jong-un to go in a different direction. By itself, in isolation, uh, I, I, I can't measure the merit of it. But as part of the combination of activities, that cocktail of pressure that was ongoing at the time, it added benefit in that. The seriousness that was taken by international communities on this, and I, trust me, I had a lot of conversations with groups of ambassadors, they, and they wanted to meet with me as groups. I routinely met with the UN sending states ambassadors, but the EU ambassadors, the Latin American ambassadors, the African Union ambassadors also wanted to meet as a group to get direct communication with me as a military leader, sensing that uh, if something were happening, they would get that indication first from a military commander and who also happened to be the senior U.S. official in the country at the time. Uh, so it, it was concerning to them, but that really is part of the condition of pressure. Uh, they had reason to be concerned, and so did North Korea in that particular pr uh, point in time. After that then, it's how do you restore relationships and restore confidence? And maybe it creates a broader wave of diplomatic action and engagement that's required, and I, I can't say whether or not we've adequately engaged in that at the present time. I would submit to you that we haven't <coughs> sufficiently engaged in the degree of, of restoring confidence in U.S. judgment uh, that needs to come as a result of a circumstance like that. Well, Jiwak said, said we could uh, restart the shot clock, so to speak, here. So 
we'll uh, we'll do that. I invented the shot clock in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Not as an overexpired. And the uh, the far back there on the window. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is June. I'm an undergrad. I was wondering if you could talk about kind of the U.S.'s future plans for the FAD missile, as well as um, how the U.S. has kind of um, take, uh, taken account for the destabilizing consequences of inserting missile defense systems in South Korea, for instance, from like North Korea or China as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. I don't know the future plan for FAD because I'm no longer in government. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, it's there for a reason. Uh, it, it, and its primary reason is to defend against North Korean medium range and highly lofted intermediate range ballistic missiles. That's why it's there. North Korea still has those. The THAAD should still stay there. That, uh, would, that was my military advice. And if I were asked to give it today, that's what I would still say. So the future of THAAD is tied to the future of North Korean missile programs and the relationship that North Korea has with South Korea and the United States. If we have a positive relationship, it's possible that that no longer, no longer would be needed. There are other countries around the world who have missile capability, and we don't find them threatening, and therefore we don't have a need to deploy missile defenses. The provocative aspect of it is a consequence of defense. I, I think it was handled as carefully as possible. The fact that it, it was uh, uh, slowed in implementation as the Park Geun-hye regime and, and, uh, and administration came to an end mm -hmm. Uh, was perhaps not accidental, that those from internal political pressures inside of Republic of Korea and external political pressures from Beijing. That it was implemented shortly uh, before the, the change of leadership was more a function of when the agreement was made economically for the land that was involved. It was not a function of the fact that the administration was changing. And my commitment to the Minister of Defense and to the President of the Republic at the time was as soon as we have clearance to move on to the land, we'll begin deploying in a matter of days. And we were in a posture to do that for six months. It could have happened anywhere in there. So we might have deployed months earlier than we did. That's when the land deal occurred. That's when we deployed the first two uh, systems into place. The administration then changed. And uh, President Moon had run on slowing this discussion on THAAD and saving it for the next administration. And there was a degree of frustration that came with that. When it was all said and done, though, the population said more than 50 percent approved of the deployment of that. And so that became a different political dynamic for the newly elected president at that point in time. We then slowed how we expanded the land use, but we deployed all six systems. So it is the only place in the world where we have the six launching systems and the radar deployed in one place. Even in Guam, where we deployed first in the region, doesn't have all six deployed. So while it has been somewhat controversial, I, I will certainly acknowledge that, it has also been effective, and we've been very careful, uh, I should say in past tense, we were very careful to make sure that the volume was lowered on it. Once it's in place, stop talking about it. Okay, and that's to be left entirely for the most senior levels of government to discuss it. But militarily, it was there for a purpose that purpose was being fulfilled and is still being fulfilled as South Korea's defended area is much better off now than it was before that system was deployed. Vince, another, uh, another alliance question. Uh, clearly, if you're the Korean people, you have a view of the United States in the Korean Peninsula as reassurance and necessary, given the threats that they face. But you have this combined Forces Command, which is commanded by an American general. Now, there's another side that would say the Korean people, very proud, nationalistic people, that they would want to have a Korean commander. So there's been this debate for decades now about operational control. There were timelines that were agreed to that Korea would take the operational control, combined forces command. Those have been periodically delayed. We may end up with the situation we've got in the Korean Peninsula going for another 10 to 15 years beyond. What is your view? What kind of advice do you give when these debates come up about where Washington, some in Washington say, we really want the ROK to take the operational control? 
And you've got people in Korea saying, we want to take operational control. Then you have voices against that. How do you view this? Well, it's interesting because there certainly are voices of support and voices against in each country as well as in the region uh, beyond Korea and, and South Korea and the United States. Uh, first, the operational control of forces in wartime, which is what we're talking about, operational control of forces in wartime currently is held by an American, the position that I held, and it will transfer to South Korea. So we're on a trajectory to do that. We have to make sure the conditions are right. Among the conditions are the environment. So is, is it right when you're in a heated condition like we were in 2017 or 18, two years after the initially desired time, actually the extension of the desired time, because the objective was 2012, right. then again 2015. <coughs> But in 2015, we had an escalating condition. We had exchanges happening in the demilitarized zone. We had loudspeakers being activated. We had a, a, another nuclear test. We had all sorts of things that are happening. Is that the right time to change? Change leadership if the command's purpose is unity of command. And so the conditions of the environment have really dictated uh, some of the pace of, of handing the leadership mantle to a South Korean four-star general. But I'm confident that that will happen. And it was my advice that we proceed with that when the conditions are right. Now, with that then comes, there's a different mental condition that has to apply in both countries, in both capitals especially. What does that mean to the United States? The U.S. has a principle of not subordinating, subordinating its forces to international commanders, except in certain circumstances. And we, we have some practice with that around the world, but if that throws up the John Pershing rule, another first captain from West Point, if that throws up the John Pershing rule of no, they're going to be in a unified U.S. command and we'll take high command through our most senior commander. That may hinder, from the U.S. perspective, our willingness to hand over command to a South Korean. So there's, there's actually debate that is required in both capitals. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely clear in the United States what it means. And so that debate ought to occur. It's not entirely clear in South Korea what that means. Uh, for example, it doesn't mean that it's now a unilateral command that's run by the South Koreans. And many of the uh, ideologues, if you will, the progressive ideologues and the nationalists who are in South Korea believe that that's the case, that when we have a Korean general, he'll then be beholden to the Blue House, but that's not the case. That is a combined command that is always beholden to two presidents, uh, two presidents and two administrations. And that should still be the case. And we have to emphasize that that's still the case. So it will happen in time. There's more understanding that needs to occur as part of the condition setting. And the environment still has to change. Okay. <coughs> Can we go to, uh, <coughs> would you like to uh, close it out then right now? Yeah, yes, that's it. Okay. Yes, yeah. Could I, I wonder if I do like a, less a final question to uh, end maybe on a more strategic note here. And that is, um, so Vince, uh, America and our national security community, we use this expression dime about diplomacy, information, military, economic, all the levers of national power. You were in a very unique position during the time of uh, maximum pressure where you were looking at all these instruments, but very frankly, de facto, you were on the, in the peninsula, you were pretty well in charge of D and M, diplomatic and military. So as you reflect on that period of time, not only in the Korean Peninsula, but just more broadly for the United States, what are your thinking, what's your thinking about the relationship of diplomacy and the military tools? Well, I, I thought this was really a kind of a classic illustration of how to make sure the military instrument was serving each one of these other instruments of national power as you describe it. And I always add three more, financial, intelligence and law enforcement. So those are three more instruments that the U.S. brings to bear globally as advanta advantageous power. Uh, so the objective here during that time and the counsel that I would give to anyone who's entering into this type of a position in the future is how can you use the military instrument to create greater leverage, greater bite in those other instruments? And whether that's the recommendation we made, sometimes the competition of the best idea was very important. And it could be military strategists who say, here's a financial opportunity out there that we really ought to capitalize on if that idea hadn't come up in other circles. But more importantly, it's the implementation of that 
using the military instrument in such a way that it doesn't undermine these others. In fact, creates greater bite, greater uh, pain, if you will, when you're talking about sanctions. You're looking for pain. You're looking for pressure. And so uh, how do we enable law enforcement? Well, if there's, a, if there's a UN Security Council resolution that says that certain activities are not to occur on the high seas, the military instrument can be used for that purpose to create a law enforcement outcome if that's desired, if there's smuggling or, or international uh, illicit activity occurring. Uh, can U.S. military intelligence be used to highlight illicit activity across borders? Can that be used to create diplomatic pressure on countries who are allowing it? Example, the Chinese border or the Russian border. And the answer is yes. And so we have to be thoughtful about how to use each of the military instruments, each of the military activities, I should say, collectively with all these other instruments. And the more thoughtful we are about that, the more effective we are, and candidly, the more valuable we are. Uh, it's been my experience, and uh, this will be certainly, uh, you know, I'll admit to a degree of bias, but because of the military's size and its ability to move in a direction when given a, a changed mission or purpose, it's a very effective instrument and can be used very deftly to create traction and leverage in every other instrument of national power. It isn't a substitute for those by any means. There are limits to military power. But as an enabler, a condition creator, a, a pressurizer, uh, it's an excellent instrument, and that's how we used it for the last several years. And I think we saw results. Then uh, you were in command during a, a period of time in the Korean Peninsula where I don't think any theater commander, maybe since the uh, Second World War, has been looking at contingency plans that had the implications that uh, yours did. Uh, we're very fortunate that you were leading our forces and the Korean forces and the UN command during that period of time, and very proud to be on the stage with you here Thank this you afternoon. Great pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you.